The next morning, when he woke up, the room was almost dark, and Jack jumped out of bed and ran to the window to see what was the matter. The sun was shining brightly outside, but from the ground right up beside the window, there was growing a great beanstalk, which stretched up and up as far as he could see into the sky. I'll just see where it leads to, thought Jack. With that, he stepped out of the window and onto the beanstalk and began to climb upwards. He climbed up and up till after a time, his mother's cottage looked like a mere speck below. But at last, the stalk ended and he found himself in a new and beautiful country. A little way off, there was a great castle with a broad road leading straight up the front gate. But what most surprised Jack was to find a beautiful maiden suddenly standing beside him. Good morning, ma'am, he said politely. Good morning, Jack said she, and Jack was more surprised than ever, for he could not imagine how she had learned his name. But he soon found that she knew a great deal more about him than his name. For she told him how, when he was quite a little baby, his father, a gallant knight, had been slain by the giant who lived in yonder castle. And how his mother, in, the, in order to save Jack, had been obliged to promise never to tell that secret. All that the giant has is yours, she said, and then disappeared, quite as suddenly as she came. She must be a fairy, thought Jack, and as he near, drew near the castle, he saw the giant's wife standing at the door. If you please, ma'am, he said, would you kindly give me some breakfast? I have had nothing to eat since yesterday. Now the giant's wife, although very big and very ugly, had a kind heart, so she said, very well, little man, come in. But you must be quite quick about it, for my husband, the giant, finds you here. He will eat you up, bones and all. So in Jack went, the giant's wife gave him a good breakfast. But before he had half finished, they ca there came a terrible knock at the front door, which seemed to shake even the thick walls of the castle. Dear me, that's my husband, said the giantess, in a terrible fright. We must hide you somehow. And she lifted Jack up and popped him in an empty kettle. No sooner had the giant's wife opened the door than her husband roared out, Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Nonsense, said his wife. You must be mistaken. It's the ox's hide you smell. So he sat down and ate up the greater part of the ox. When he had finished, he said, Wife, bring me my money bags. So the wife brought him two full bags of gold, and the giant began to count his money. But he was so sleepy that his head soon began to nod, and then he began to snore like a rumbling of thunder. Then Jack crept out, snatched up the two bags, and though the giant's dog barked loudly, he made his way to the beanstalk, back down to the cottage, before the giant awoke. That's a story about a little boy who was in horrible shape. Life was over, he was helpless, there was nothing he could do. But then there came a vine, a beanstalk, that he could be connected to. And as long as he stayed connected to that vine, to that beanstalk, he would have access to everything. You see, some evil man had stolen his inheritance, but he could now get his inheritance back as long as he stayed connected to the vine. There was hope in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of despair, by staying connected to the vine. You know, that's not the first time that story was ever told. Jesus told that story by way of an analogy, by way of a picture that he painted way earlier than Jack and the Beanstalk was ever written. Before we look at the gospel, let's pause for a minute. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we just thank you. We thank you that we can come before you and lift our voices in praise. We thank you that we know that death was arrested and our life has begun in Christ Jesus because indeed he paid it all. And Lord, we praise you for that. <laughs> And we come to do it today and we can bring our prayers and petitions to you and just lay them at your throne and know that there's no, no better place to leave them. And know that you care about us and you hear our prayers. Lord, now, as, you, as, we have, as we have spoken to you, we ask that you would speak to us. As we open your word and look at your word, we ask that your spirit working with your word would not just speak to us, but would transform us. 
Lord, today again, we ask that you would purify for yourself a people, a people that you have chosen in Christ Jesus, a people who might be zealous for good deeds. And we ask this, that the name of our Lord and Savior might be lifted up and magnified in all that we say and all that we do and all that we are. It's through him that we pray. Amen. Amen. We're, in that, we're in John chapter 15. We're going to read the first 11 verses. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he proves that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he... It is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burn. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. As we look at this passage of Scripture this morning, I want us to, to understand, first of all, that we need to abide in Jesus, the true vine, and let him abide in you. Jesus says, as he explains what he's talking about, I am the vine. And God is the vine dresser. Now this is a different way than the vine was portrayed in the Old Testament. Grapes have always been a part of Israel's history. You find passages about grapes and grape vines and all those things all throughout the Bible. Uh, it was an important crop in the Middle East, an important crop for Israel. But in the Old Testament, when God talked about vines, he always talked about Israel being the vine. God was the vine dresser, but Israel was the vine. Now that has changed. Jesus says there's a new way of looking at this agricultural analogy, if you will. You need to understand that you are no longer the vine. I am the vine. When you read stories in the Old Testament about, the Old Testament about Israel being the vine, it's usually not very good. Israel was not a good vine. Uh, they didn't really do what a vine was supposed to do. They didn't produce grapes. They produced wild grapes. They... they didn't produce anything. They, they were just a mess. And so Jesus says, forget about being the vine. You aren't the vine. You don't do good at vining. I'm the vine. All you have to do is stay connected to me. You need to be a branch in the vine. So let's kind of rethink the way we're doing this. Jesus talks about the consequences of failing to abide in the vine. The consequences of failure to abide. And and, and there are a couple that he talks about, and it really depends on the degree of failing to abide. But for those who never abide in the vine, for those who refuse to be connected to the vine, one of the consequences, or the consequence is punishment. Look at verse 6 again. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If a branch fails to be connected to the vine, if a branch says, I don't need that vine, I don't, I don't want that vine, I don't like what that vine has to offer, then that branch has no source of life and that branch is dead. It is thrown away, it dries up, it's cast into the fire. Several ways of saying that that branch is no more. For those who fail to abide in Jesus, the giver of all life, for those who say, I'll find my life some other way than the only source of life, the consequences are death. The consequences, unmistakably, logically, are to dry up, to wither away, to be cast away into fire. There's another group of folks who fail to abide, and those who are, that's those who resist abiding. And for them, the consequences are pointlessness. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you are a branch and you have dedicated your life to Jesus and you're connected to the vine, 
And then you say, you know, I, I, I know I need to be connected to the vine, but maybe I can be connected to something else. Maybe I, I can get a little bit of nutrition out of the vine, but I don't need to be really tightly connected to the vine. I can just sort of be loosely joined to the vine. Obviously, that doesn't make sense in agriculture. And Jesus says that doesn't make sense for us as Christians. If we aren't really connected to the vine, where we sort of resist what the vine has to offer, then our lives become pointless. We can't bear any fruit. The purpose of the vine, the purpose of the grape plant itself is to produce grapes. Nobody has a grape vine just to have a grape vine, or at least not in Jesus' day. You wanted the grapes from the grape vine. Jesus says that your life is pointless. It, you aren't doing what you need to be doing. It, it, it's just sort of an empty exercise if you're not fully connected to the vine. By this time of year, the process of weeding my garden becomes much easier. When in the spring, when the plants first begin to sprout up, I have to make a decision. Does this look like a squash plant? Does this look like a cucumber plant? Or is this a weed? Does this, and especially if you go, this year I grew basil for the first time. Now, okay, what's that look like? And, and after a while you can tell, okay, it must be, everything's neatly lined up in a row. Uh, that must be the basil. But what if something else is in that row or whatever? You, so it's, it's kind of hard. You've got to make a decision about what stays and what goes. This time of year, you're not connected to a vine, you're going. If you're not connected to the tomato vine, yarn anything I want. You're not connected to the squash plant, yarn anything I want. You're just... Connect to the soil and nothing else, bam, you go. you got to be connected to the vine to stay. If you're not connected to the vine, you're a weed and you're worthless. If, say, you're a tomato plant, maybe a, a tomato has fallen to the ground and, and died and the seeds are in the ground and begin to sprout up, by the middle of September, you ain't doing me any good. Sorry. It's too late for you to be a little bitty sprout of a tomato plant. You're gone. you got to be connected to the vine. Jesus says... Life is like that with him. We've got to be connected to the vine. There is no life apart from the vine, and if you're kind of loosely connected to the vine and really not getting everything you need from the vine, then your life isn't what it could be and what it should be. After talking about the consequences of failure to abide, he talks about the circumstances of abiding. What does it mean? What are we talking about? And he begins by talking about how we may originate abiding in the vine. First of all, let's do a little bit of background work and talk about this vine. In Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, and then I'm going to read a couple other verses, uh, the Old Testament talks about this image of the vine. Let me sing for my beloved my song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed it with a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for, to do for my vineyard that I had not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall be pruned. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that the rain, that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are the pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. And I'm going to skip down, and I'm going to read in verse 13. Therefore, my people go to exile for lack of knowledge. Their honored men go hungry. Their multitude is parched with thirst. Now I'm going to skip down to Isaiah 5, but still Isaiah 5. This time I'm going to read verse 26. He will raise a signal for nations far and away and whistle for them from the ends of the earth. And behold, quickly, speedily, they come. There's a couple more verses. I'm not going to read those right now. I will pick up in Psalm 80 in just a minute. God said, look, I planted a vineyard. I gave life to the nation of Israel. But for me, they would not exist. But for him, none of us would exist. And those grapes, those vineyards produce wild grapes. That's not what I wanted. 
And so God said, I'm going to remove that hedge and, and a protection around Israel and, and uh, uh, thorns and thistles will come in. The beasts from the fields will come in. Everything's going to come in and tear it up. And so Israel went into exile. But God promised, even in the midst of that, in Isaiah chapter 5, that he's going to whistle and call his people back to it. Let's look how God explains this in the 80th Psalm, verses 8 through 18. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and it shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls? So that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit. The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine. The stock that is in your that your right hand is planted, and the son whom you have made strong for, for yourself. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man, whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life and we shall call upon your name. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Why has God allowed the nation of Israel to be trampled down? Because they rebelled against him. Why has God allowed our lives to be trampled down, to be broken, to have to, have to deal with the ravages of all the problems that we have to deal with because of sin? Because we broke away from God and we decided to go our own way and we didn't stay connected to the one who was to, who gave us all life. We went out on our own, became our own branch, decided we didn't need the vine. The consequences of that is death. But God doesn't want us to die. God didn't want the nation of Israel to die. God doesn't want us to die. So God says, call on me and I will re I will give you life. Repent. Return to me and you will be my child. Call on me and you will be saved. That message from the Old Testament is the message of the New Testament, is the message of all of creation, of all of time. For when we rebel against God, when we sin against God, when we break away from God, and if we realize that and we repent of our sin and we believe that Jesus died on a cross to pay the price for our sin, that God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die in our place. If we trust Jesus for our salvation and allow the risen Christ now come into our hearts, come into our lives, let him be the Lord of our life. Let him be the vine that we're connected to and get our life from. The Bible says we will be saved. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in me. God loved the world so much that he sent his only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Jesus loved us so much that he willingly followed what the father had in store for him. Laid down his life for our sin. How can we be saved? If we simply receive God's love and God's free gift of salvation in Jesus. That's how we can abide on the vine. Now his disciples are clean. His disciples are abiding. Verse 3 says, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Now they still need Jesus to die on the cross. They need for that transaction to occur. But because of the word Jesus has spoken to them, they will understand someday perfectly exactly what he's been talking about and what he's done for them. But for those of us who haven't received him, we need to make that commitment. We need to let Jesus Christ come into our hearts. If that house is how we originate abiding in Jesus, how may we order our lives to continue abiding in Jesus? Now, don't, let, don't get me wrong. The Bible doesn't say we're going to lose our salvation. But Jesus makes it very clear that we can sort of break our branch off from the vine, partly. And we're protected throughout eternity, but we're breaking ourselves off from the nutrients of the vine, from, the, from all the things that the vine has to offer. So how do we order our lives to make sure we're not breaking away from the vine? Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. We need to let Jesus' words abide in us. 
Jack and the Beanstalk is a neat story, but it's not going to change your life. The words of the living Christ, God's word, is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, and it will cut to the very marrow, to the very heart of who we are, and separate that which is evil from that which is good, that which is destructive from that which is life, that which is sin from that which is from God. We need to let the word of God penetrate our hearts. We, that's why we, we come and, and the center of our worship is the word of God. That's why uh, before this worship service, we had Sunday school where you can come and, and hear the word of God even more. We place a big priority on the Word of God. Why do we pray, place such a big priority on it? Because we need to hear that Word and let that Word sink in and let it dictate our lives. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. We need to obey God. We need to obey the commandments of Jesus. We need to order our lives to follow the direction of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we stay connected to the vine. When we say the words of Jesus are irrelevant, they're old, they're, they're uh, you know, I want his blood and I want his forgiveness and I want his salvation, but I don't want him telling me what to do in my life, then we break away from the vine, at least in part, and we cause our life for him, our Christian walk, to basically become pointless. We need to follow his commandments. So what is the outcome of abiding in Jesus? What does that get for us? Well, verse 5 says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to me my disciples. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. Obviously, if you abide in the vine, you bear much fruit. It makes sense. If you're kind of hanging off the grapevine, kind of half connected, you aren't going to bear much fruit. But if you're connected to the vine, you will produce this big cluster of grapes, this big group of fruit, if you will. That's the outcome of abiding in Jesus. Great. So what's fruit? There are several things that the New Testament talks about. I mean, there are some things that are in this passage. Let me say what it isn't. A lot of times we think of fruit as people that we have led to Christ. And while that is an important thing for us to do, the Bible doesn't say that, okay, you, you've led 10 people to Christ, you're really a good fruit producer, and, and you've led five people to Christ, and so you're, a, you're not such a good fruit producer, and, and you haven't led anybody to Christ, well, you know, maybe you're not so good. It's not a, a numerical thing that we tally up our scores and see who's producing the most fruit. But we are supposed to produce fruit, and telling other people about Jesus is part of that. Part of the fruit of knowing Jesus and abiding in the vine is eternal fruit, having an eternal perspective. And part of having an eternal perspective is telling others where they can find eternal life and sharing with others that Jesus wants to come into their heart, forgive their sin, give them eternal life. And when we tell folks that, some of those folks are going to respond and receive Jesus. And so that's great. That's part of bearing fruit. The New Testament talks about bearing fruit as goodness, righteousness, and truth. Wanting good to happen to others. Wanting good to happen in our world. Living a righteous life. Being obedient to God. Living the way we should. Having a high value on truth. Wanting to know the truth. There are so many people who want to be lied to today. So many people who, who just crave a lie because it makes them feel better. And the truth doesn't always make you feel better, but the truth is always the truth. Amen. One of the consequences, or one of, one of the advantages of abiding in the vine is abiding in truth. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. All of those things come from abiding in Jesus. If we have a problem with self-control, maybe we're not abiding in Jesus. We have a problem with patience. Maybe we're not, with, we're not abiding in Jesus. 
a problem loving folks, maybe we're not abiding in Jesus. All of those things are fruit of abiding in Jesus. Another fruit is lips that give praise. When we come today or we come together and we just praise God, you know, when we just say death was arrested, my life began. When Jesus Christ, who died for my sin, came into my heart, that is the fruit of abiding in him. Now, there's some things specifically listed here. Ask whatever you want and it will be given to you. Well, it doesn't really quite say that, does it? If you look at the context, it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you wish. So we can't say, God, zap my enemy. This guy ought to die, God. Because we know that scripture says, thou shalt not kill. And, and revenge, any vengeance belongs to God. And we are to love even our enemies. So if we ask God to kill our enemy, it's probably not going to happen because we're not abiding in Jesus to even make that request. Now that's an extreme answer, but a lot of times that happens in our prayer life. Scripture doesn't say ask whatever you want. I don't care what some of the biggest preachers in America tell you. Scripture doesn't say ask whatever you want for you and you're gonna get it. It says for those of us who are abiding in Jesus, seeking his will and his way, when we ask well, whatever we want, consistent with that, then God hears our prayers and answers our prayers. Verse 8 says that abiding in Jesus glorifies the Father. How, how, am, I going to, how am I going to make God great today? How am I going to make sure the world knows that God is God and he is on the throne and he is great? Simply live for Jesus. You know, a lot of times we want to make a big show and how can I uh, do some kind of magic trick and have, you know, all kinds of people say, ooh, ah, you don't need that. In fact, Jesus goes on to say, abiding in me proves your discipleship. Sometimes we look back. We say, I don't have, I didn't preach a big revival where a thousand people came to know Jesus. I, I, don't, I didn't do any magic tricks, and I've never told somebody in a wheelchair to get up and walk and have them walk right out of the church. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've not done those things. Maybe I'm not a very good disciple. Maybe I'm not a disciple at all. Are you living for Jesus? Are you obeying his word, obeying his commandments, seeking to give him glory in your life? When you look back on life, and, and Satan will do this to you. Satan will say, well, well, maybe you're not even really a Christian. Or maybe you're just not a good Christian. Just ignore him. Ignore the big giant that's already been defeated. When the vine was cut down, death was defeated. The giant was defeated. Sin was defeated. And happily ever after began. Don't listen to that. Look back and, and a life well lived is a life lived for Jesus, a life lived following Jesus, a life lived connected to Jesus. And it produces joy. Verse 11, these things I have written you that, you, that joy may be in you and your joy may be full. You want to be happy? Is not drinking Mountain Dew and hanging out the fishing hole. <laughs> I drink a lot of Mountain Diet Mountain Dew. But that's not, that gives me absolutely no joy. Sometimes I get happy, but it doesn't give me any joy. The joy that I have is in following Jesus. And there's so many things in life that we look at and that, that product advertisers tell us and, and the world tells us, this is what you'll find joy in, this is where you'll find joy. There is no joy in any of it. There's only joy in being connected to Jesus. My garden now, finally, is producing fruit. I'm enjoying that fruit. The squash plants have squash on them. The pepper plants have peppers on them. The tomato plants have tomatoes and on and on and on. Sometimes maybe not as much as I want or I think I ought to get. Sometimes more than I can possibly use. 
But those vines that I have, those, those plants that I have nurtured all summer and, and paid close attention to the vine have grown up and now they're producing fruit. And Jesus says that's what happens to our lives when we stay connected to him. Just as certainly as you plant those little seeds in, in May and hope they come up, by the end of the summer, they're producing fruit. So those little seeds that you begin to plant by staying connected to the vine, early in life, late in life, whenever it is, those eventually bear fruit. Finally, I want to remind you that abiding in the true vine necessitates action by the vine dresser. Did you notice I skipped verse 2? Let's go back and look at verse 2. Every branch in me does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Branches that do not bear fruit, the vine dresser will take away. Again, you've got to read all of Scripture. This passage isn't saying that we're going to lose our salvation if we don't stay connected to the vine. But what it does say is this, this fruit, we won't bear this fruit. It'll be taken away. The joy that we should have in following Christ is taken away. There are a lot of people who, just, who have been miserable and not serve God, and they get, get older in life, and they drift away from the church, and they, they, they just become nasty, miserable people. There's no joy in their life. There's no human connection with other folks. They're, they're, just, they're missing out so much of what God has in store for them because somehow through the years they've just become disconnected from the vine. There, there are so many young people who, are, who start their life and think, this is going to make me happy. This is what's going to make me successful. And this is what's going to be good for my life. And they get disconnected from the vine in some way. And, and they go through life and they begin to realize none of this stuff is making them happy. And they just become more and more broken and more and more miserable. Jesus says for the church... In the book of Revelation that doesn't follow him will take away their candlestick. Remove them. To the branches that bear much fruit. I would love to tell you that he sets them on a pedestal. That he puts fancy ribbons and trappings around them and invites everybody to come and look at them. But that's not what he says. He prunes. And sometimes pruning hurts. There you go. <laughs> but sometimes we need to be pruned a little bit, to be fashioned more into what he wants us to be. For those who are bearing fruit, there's going to come times when we prune. And, and pruning is changing. There is no plant that you prune that looks the same before you pruned it. It's change. And we don't like change. And sometimes we accuse older folks, you know, retired folks, they don't ever want to change. Folks, teenagers don't like change either. <laughs> None of us like change. And God says, if you're producing fruit, I'm going to change you so you produce more. I'm going to prune you. I'm going to put you in a position so that you are producing more fruit. That's what he's done from time to time at Island City in the past. There have been a lot of changes that have gone on in the almost 20 years that we've been at church. There are a lot of changes that have gone on in our lives. There are a lot of times when, when God changes us, and, and we don't like that. Uh, God has changed us, changed Tina and I. We're, we're different. We serve different. We act differently than we did when we had two little girls at home. Did not look forward to those little girls getting out on their own. It was painful. But God used that both to help them, to prune them, to become what God wants them to be, and to prune us. And it goes on and on and on. God changes us, changes our circumstances, changes the situation so that we can continue to bear fruit and bear even more fruit.